week. But before you come to lab, you need to have the pre-lab for all of the parts, all three reactions in, in your um, notebook. So make sure you have the pre-lab for the entire experiment, both weeks, in your notebook this week. And that's what we will be checking for. Um, you'll have a quiz this week, as always. Um, open lab for Friday. Our history seminar on Friday starts at 3 o'clock in the usual place in 1000. Um, and so the open lab will be closing at 2.30 on Friday because we only close a half hour before seminar on Friday. So this week's seminar is an hour earlier. Um, next week we'll finish experiment seven, parts two and three. And then your experiment three rewrite of your conclusion is due next week as well. So you should be getting your notebooks back with your experiment three report graded in it. Now you wanna look at all that feedback because you're going to rewrite the conclusion and try and rewrite a better conclusion this time, okay? And your instructors will talk, talk about that this, this week. In two weeks, we will be starting experiment eight. Um, that is one that you want to make sure you read ahead and we'll talk a little bit more about that one next week as well as um, in two weeks, but keep in mind experiment eight. It's a, it's a week of a lot of stuff going on in lab, okay? So you wanna be well prepared. And your experiment six, report sheet and conclusion are due in two weeks, okay? And then the other thing is, if you're attending the medical missions conference, um, which is usually the first week of November, um, and you are in a Thursday lab, because they usually leave the first thing in the morning on Thursday, so you would miss lab, you need to see me because we need to get you into a Tuesday lab section. The lab we're doing that week can't be done during open lab. It has to be done in another lab section. So you need to see me right away so we can start getting that scheduled. All right, so I'm gonna go through um, experiment seven and give you an overview of all of the pieces. And then um, we'll talk in general about polymers and then specifically about the reaction that we're going to be doing in lab this week. So there, it's a three-step sequence is what we are going to use three re reactions to get to our final product of polystyrene. And we're using um, chemistry that we haven't used before, um, some interesting chemistry that you're also learning about in lecture, and then in the end we're going to be making a polymer. So the first reaction of our sequence, which is the one we'll do this week, we will take ethyl benzene and we are going to brominate it and make bromoethyl benzene. So we're going to be using n bromo benzoyl peroxide, and we're going to do this in hexane at reflux. This is our step one reaction. And this reaction is a radical reaction, so it'll be the first time in lab we have done one of those, and we will do actually two of those in this reaction sequence. So we make bromoethylbenzene. So this bromination is called a free radical benzylic, we'll talk more about that, where it occurs, um, a bromination reaction. So a couple things I'm going to put over here. We need to define what our NBS is and what our benzoyl peroxide is. So this is our NBS, n bromo succinamide. So um, all spelled out. There it is, or otherwise known as NBS. And we'll talk about this guy um, in more detail here in a little bit because that is our bromine source for this reaction. And then we have benzoyl peroxide, which is our source of radicals to get this reaction started. why this is something handy to use for this reaction, okay? The next step of the reaction
reaction, we are going to make styrene. So we take our bromoethyl benzene from this week, and the first thing we will do next week is we will react it um, in the presence of quinoline. We'll talk about this step next week in more detail, but here's our quinoline. It's our base for the reaction, so we'll talk about why we, we need this particular base. And this step, step two, is called a dehydrohalogenation. So we are going to take a hydrogen and a halogen away to make our styrene. Polymers came from. 
first of all, people started finding naturally occurring polymers, like rubber from the rubber tree, and they found uses for that. And then they decided, well, we've got these naturally occurring polymers, could we make them better? So they started modifying those naturally occurring polymers to see what they could do to make, make them better. Um, and then people started, after that, thinking about, okay, how can we just, instead of having to go to the rubber tree and trying to find the rubber tree, let's make the rubber just like what comes out of the rubber tree um, and synthesize these natural polymers. And then people started thinking about, okay, well, why, why mimic everything after what is um, available in nature? Let's go for things that people have never seen before with properties that have never been known before. And so um, <coughs> synthetic pol um, polymers were popular, popularized. But a big day in the history of polymers was December 7th, 1941. So what date was that? Pearl Harbor Day, and what, what happened to the U.S. that day? We entered World War II, right? And so, all of a sudden, instantaneously, we had this huge need for um, all sorts of different pieces of equipment and um, things to make the equipment, but the biggest thing that we needed right away was sources of rubber because all of a sudden we had vehicles and um, uh, all like our military needed all of this um, equipment right away and they needed to have tires you know on their tanks and vehicles and things like that and so um, the biggest crisis that um, uh, President Roosevelt saw happening to us not winning the war and not getting out of the war successfully was not having enough sources of rubber and other other polymers, but specifically rubber. And so um, this is just an example of what natural rubber would do. So natural rubber, here's some strands of natural rubber, then you stretch the rubber and then you put it back, try and put it back together after stretching. And so um, it wouldn't ever go exactly back to its original shape. Um, it'd need a little help to the, with that. And so what people found is with vulcanized rubber, if they cross-linked that rubber, so where are these black dots, and now we have our three strands, our red, our green, our blue strand, and where we have these black dots are where they're cross-linked, they're, the pieces of rubber, the strands of rubber are bound together. When you would stretch it, it would come back um, <coughs> to its original shape after stretching. And so that was a huge, um, had a huge impact on the need for rubber is figuring out how to make it so it's usable more, o more over and over again. It had more um, repeatable uses instead of being stretched out so quickly. Now, um, there's many different architectures that you can think about um, as far as macular and molecular architectures with polymers. And so polymers are these big molecules with lots of pieces to them, hence the macro molecular instead of just a molecule. Um, and so we could link the pieces of a polymer together linearly. We could um, so just put all the pieces together here in a line. We could put the pieces together <coughs> in a line and then put some branches off of it. So that's kind of, that's called a branched architecture. We could have something in the center that all the polymers build off of and grow their chains off of. So that's more a star um, architecture. We could have this cross-linked network, which is like what the, um, happened with the vulcanized rubber, getting the cross-linking bonds in between the other strands so that all the pieces are um, tied together more tightly, gives the structure more rigidity. Or something like this dendritic um, architecture where we have this core and then we have many things branching off of it and many things branching off the branches. So unlike, well like the star, it's a network of branches, but it's a much more complex network of branches with the branches having their own branches. The other thing with polymers is you can mix um, what molecules are together. So we're going to make a polymer of um, 
polystyrene, we're just going to have repeated styrene units. But you don't have to just have the same units repeated over and over again. Okay, so you can have um, you can have units repeated randomly. So you can have two different pieces or multiple different pieces of your polymer, and they're just randomly worked in there together, um, which would give different types of properties. You could have things like um, block polymers, where you have a block of one set of monomers um, linked together and a block of another set of monomers linked together. This is a lot like what happens with saran wrap. Um, or you could have just alternating back and forth between two or more sets of um, monomers um, and get this alternating pattern just back and forth between, between the monomers. So this is like, um, if you remember the demo of making nylon um, that you, they'll show you like in high school or show you in Gen Chem Lab or Gen, Gen, Gen Chem Lecture, that alternating pattern um, is what you've got in the nylon polymer. So here's here's an example of this um, saran wrap. Saran wrap is made of ethylene and acrylic acid. Um, and so the strong piece of the saran wrap is due to the ethylenes put together. And then what the acrylic acid adds is the sti sticky hydrophilic piece that's going to stick to glass because that's what um, saran wrap is intended for um, sticking to, is sticking to the silica pieces, hydrogen bonding, um, and um, sticking to the silicates. Um, so that's why like, it sticks well to like corningware, but it doesn't stick really well to like, paper plates when you try and put saran wrap around paper plates. Um, so with saran wrap, saran wrap, it'll have this whole block of the ethylene portion and the whole block of the acrylic acid portion, and then add on another block of ethylene and another block of the acrylic um, acid. Whereas this is kind of the standard synthesis of nylon demo where you have the dipoyl chloride in one layer and then you have the 1,6 hexane diamine in another layer and at that interface is where you get the um, nylon to form and it's alternating every um, every monomer between the uh, dipoyl chloride and then the 1,6 hexane diamine. And so you've just got basically these two pieces put together and they just keep repeating those two pieces over and over again. Okay. So in context of styrene, but also pertains to gen, um, poly polymers in general, so we're in the end going to be taking styrene and making polystyrene. So styrene itself has a molecular weight of 104.15. Polystyrene can have hundreds of thousands as far as the molecular weight. It can be really large depending on, on how you make it and what you do to control um, the size of, of the polymer. We, the polymer we're going to be making is usually in the thousands to potentially 10,000 as far as molecular weight, so it's not super long polymer strands. We don't do anything with the polystyrene to control the chain length and how long the polymers are, um, but that's about the size we end up with. But the properties of a polymer will depend on how long are those strands. What is the molecular weight? So that molecular weight is determined by how many of those repeat units you have in the polymer. Um, what is the chemical composition of those repeat units? What, it, what shape, so what um, architecture does it take on? And then also how it is processed. And if you do anything in making the polymer to have any fi final processing steps to um, either make it all of one um, chain length or a small subset of chain lengths or you just let it, let it be random sizes of polymer. Questions at all with any of that with the general general overview. Okay. So now looking more specifically at our re reflux or reflux, our reaction for this week. Things that we need to um, keep in mind. And with actually before I get into that, with with the polymers, um, 
can you think of any naturally occurring polymers that you already know something about? Proteins? Anything else? DNA? So then DNA and RNA. Um, any of those biological big macromolecules are also polymers um, in themselves. Um, so back to our reactions here. Experiment seven. We are going to be taking ethylbenzene. We're going to make bromoethylbenzene. Form styrene. And then go on to make it polymer form and make polystyrene. And we'll see how large of repeat units you end up having with, with your polystyrene. So, um, we have the reaction up there, but I'm going to draw it again so we can talk about some specifics here with the reaction. So we've got our, our um, ethyl benzene. Be careful with the ethyl benzene. Wear gloves. It does have quite a bit of a stench to it. Keep it in the hood. Um, it is something that is kind of stinky, okay? And we'll want to keep any stinky garbage in the hood as well. Don't, don't throw it in the regular garbage out, um, outside of the hood. So we'll have bags that you can stick your stinky garbage in. Um, we're going to start with our ethyl benzene. We're going to add in our NBS, and we'll have our hexane, and we'll also have our benzoyl peroxide in there all together. Okay, so all these pieces will be in there together. Um, what I would do is the last thing you do before you heat is adding add the benzoyl peroxide. Okay, so get your other pieces, your ethyl benzene and your MBS, stirring in your hexane before you're adding your benzoyl peroxide. Okay. Now the thing, um, the reason why we are using our MBS, so this is what. happens with our NBS, when it reacts with HBr, it goes on to form succinamide, so not, it's not brominated anymore, it's just got a hydrogen on it, and Br2. And so it is a source of bromine to brominate our bromyl ethyl benzene, okay? So it is our bromine source. Now the reason that we use this versus using something similar to last week where you just had bromine in dipromethane, um, the reason we're not just dripping neat bromine into our reaction is we want to be able to control that bromine formation, okay? And so by using NBS, that means that the bromine's not all going to be present and ready to be reacted all at the same time, because this reaction has to occur before the bromine is ready to react then with the bromoethylbenzene. Okay, so it's a way to have a nice, steady supply of bromine for the reaction without just chucking in a bunch of react a uh, bunch of bromine into the reaction, which would probably cause a lot of side products as well as make things really very exciting, considering this is a um, radical reaction. Okay. Now, so what you make as a byproduct of this reaction is six cinnamon. So what you're going to see with your reaction, you're going to start with um, solid in the hexane and ethyl benzene and um, benzoyl peroxide before the reflux. And then as the reflux takes place, that solid isn't going to necessarily seem like it's disappearing. But it will be, it'll be the um, NBS then forming succinamide. So in the end, you're still going to have solid at the end of your reflux. You're going to have to filter this solid out after you've cooled down your reflux, okay? So this succinamide, this nice white solid you're going to have at the end, 
is a byproduct of the reaction. You don't actually want to collect the solid, okay? And so you're going to filter it with gravity filtration, get rid of that solid. The solid itself goes into um, the waste containers with the acetone, and then the filter paper that you use for the filtration, once you've rinsed it really well with, into the waste container, is the filter paper will go in a waste container in um, the reagent hoods, okay? Because it's still gonna have quite a bit of stench from the ethyl benzene and bromo ethyl benzene on it, okay? But just remember, nice white solid, not your final product. Your final product is a liquid. So it is going to be dissolved in the hexane, all right? Then you'll do a simple distillation to re remove the hexane and then you'll have, have your bromo ethyl benzene product, okay? And we'll talk about um, here in a little bit how we're actually going to store that and be careful with that. Now, another thing that's going on in this reaction is the reaction with our benzoyl peroxide. So that benzoyl peroxide is nice and reactive and forms radicals really easily with contact of heat or light. Initial heating of our reaction is going to be forming the, the um, radicals from the um, benzoyl peroxide. This is our initial source of radicals for our um, radical chain reaction that we're going to go through here in a minute of the steps. Okay, and so that's why we have that in there. It's just an initial source of radicals, and then once we get the chain reaction going, we don't need any more um, sources of radicals. The key with this, though, is this reaction um, takes heat to get going, but once it gets going, it actually will exotherm. It will give back heat um, from, from the reaction. So what you've got to do is you've got to watch it carefully when you first start the reflux, because it will start refluxing, and then all of a sudden it'll start refluxing a lot more, and so you're going to have to turn back the heat a little bit once you actually get it refluxing. And it's all of these pieces working together in the radical chain reaction, getting our radicals started forming, our radical chain reaction going, that are making all of this um, energy and heat in the reaction. So be careful once you start the reflux. It's an hour reflux, but you need to watch it for a bit before you just completely walk away from it. You need to make sure that you've seen it, get refluxing, seen it exotherm, and see um, that it settles back down after it exotherms. The other thing you want to watch for is you actually can sometimes see the bromine being generated slowly in the reaction. So if you see any yellow, orange um, residue being formed in the reaction, or sometimes all of a sudden the mixture will turn yellow, orange, and then it'll be consumed and go away and go back and forth, that's that bromine generation. So it's a really, um, you also want to be making sure that you're taking good visual observations of what is going on. Okay. All right, so let's look at the actual chain um, for this reaction. reaction because we're taking um, one of our protons in our, our benzyl position is being substituted for a bromine. Okay, so it's a substitution reaction, not an addition reaction. Alright, so our what is the first what's 
the name of the first step when you've got a radical chain? We've got our initiation step. Our initiation step is bromine, Br2, being broken apart into bromine radicals. Okay. Now what, what comes after initiation? Propagation. Involved in our propagation. First, we've got our um, ethyl benzene. It is going to react with a bromine radical. Okay, and just remember when you show the reaction of radicals single-headed arrows, not double-headed arrows, so our other electron goes this direction. And then what we're forming is the radical of our ethyl benzene. What position is that is in relationship to the aromatic ring? the benzylic position. So one thing to consider is the ethyl of our ethyl benzene is not that much different of than the hexene solvent, but we react on the ethyl benzene, we don't react with the hexane. So that position is very key. So you want to think about why you get reaction at that benzylic position. So what's going to happen with that radical at that benzoic position versus trying to make a radical in hexane? What are you going to get? Resonance stabilization, right? You've got this aromatic ring. It's going to help stabilize that radical. So in this reaction, the benzoic position is really important. But in general, the benzylic position of most compounds, for the most part, is going to be a, a place of reactivity. So just keep that in mind now and in future, okay? And the other thing we're going to make here is HBr, and we need that HBr to then and go, go get the um, MBS going, okay? So we've got our HBr now to start <coughs> reacting with the MBS to then be making sources of bromine. The second step of the propagation is taking our ethyl benzene radical and it's going to also um, react with bromine and this is where we're going to finally get our um, product out of the mix, okay? So we've got Reaction going on, radical to a bromine radical reacting with our ethyl benzene radical, and then we're generating another bromine radical that can be reacting. So we'll get our bromoethyl benzene, and then we'll have more um, bromine radicals for future reactions. Okay, now what comes next after initiation and propagation? Termination. Termination for this is any two of these radicals combining are going to take the radicals out of play. Okay? And so eventually we'll get our um, reactions <coughs> Now, once we have our bromyl ethyl benzene formed, we need to think about ways to prove that we've actually made bromyl ethyl benzene from um, the ethyl benzene. And so one of the um, tests we're going to do is a density test relative to water.
Now, what do you think is going to happen with ethyl benzene relative to water? Should it be more dense or less dense? It's just carbon and hydrogen, right? So is it going to be more dense or less dense? Less dense, right? So what you're going to do for this density test is you're going to take 0.5 to 1 milliliter of water, no more than that. We don't need a ton of water to be able to see what's going on, and then we end up with a bunch of waste we have to deal with if you use more than that. And you're going to take a couple drops of ethyl benzene and see what happens. Does it sit on top? So you're going to have this in a test tube. Have your water, add a couple drops of ethyl benzene, and really just one or two drops. See, does it sit on top or does it sink to the bottom? Okay, and you're going to write your um, observations down. You'll do the same thing with your product. So a lot of people said this guy was going to be less dense. What's going to happen when you halogenate something? Usually what happens to two things when you halogenate them relative to water, their density? This guy should be more more dense than the water, okay? So again, so they, these are two separate test tubes, okay? So a lot of times I'll have confusion that we're going to do this all in the same test tube. This is test tube one, this is test tube two, okay? Two separate test tubes. You're looking at the same amount of water, but one you're looking at what happens when a couple drops of ethyl benzene are added to the water. The other one you're looking at a couple drops of your bromoethyl ethyl benzene product. Okay? And so um, you record the relative density. Now what do you think is going to happen if you have extra hexane left on your bromoethyl ethyl benzene? It's going to kind of play with that density test, right? If you have enough, you'll make it still float versus sink. So be careful with the distillation push that hexane off to get, get as much hexane off of your product um, before you're trying to um, get it, trying to test it with a density test. The other thing is um, you want to be able to store your product in a, as small a vial as possible. And if you, you're starting with five milliliters of ethyl benzene. So about how <coughs> much product are you going to have left once you're done? five-ish milliliters of product, right? We have seven mil vials. Those are our small vials. As much as possible, you want to try and get your product stored in those small vials because the more contact it has with the air, it could be, um, it being brominated in the benzylic position makes it very reactive. It could be reacting um, in the vial while you're storing it for next week, okay? So you want to make sure you get all the hexane off too so you can get it in a small enough vial. Okay, so be careful with the hexane distillation. Um, the other test that you are going to do is a silver nitrate test. So it's a lot, it's very similar to using silver nitrate in um, Gen Chem, except we're going to use it with um, organic compound. Okay, so our silver nitrate's in ethanol instead of in water. But well, we've got our bromoethyl benzene. We're going to react with <coughs> silver nitrate. And what we will get is a solid will form because the silver nitrate will actually react with the bromine we'll get a cation here, and then we'll get silver bromide. So it's kind of this yellow, orangish um, solid, and it's going to precipitate out, okay? So you'll start with two um, mostly clear colors liquids, add the two of them together, you should see a precipitate that forms. And wait about three to five minutes with this test. Sometimes it doesn't form immediately, but you should see a cloudy precipitate form. And so that's another positive result.
So if you get a positive um, density test, meaning that your ethylbenzene is less dense, your bromoethylbenzene is more dense, and you get a positive silver nitrate test, then you've got um, two pieces of evidence that you have made your bromoethylbenzene. If you've got an iffy density test or an iffy silver nitrate test, what's another test that you could do to test for um, the bromine? The flame test that you used last week, right? Because it's got a halogen in it, so you could test to see if you get a green flame with it too. So that's another possibility. But you want to try these two first, and then if you need to, you can resort to a third, third test if you've got conflicting results. Okay. All right. So things we need to collect some pieces of data about our um, bromo ethyl benzene. So. For our product this week, we're going to um, do our test with our product. We also need to know the yield, okay? And we need to know it two ways, okay? So you need the mass. And you need the volume, all right? The volume will come into play next week, why you need that volume. But make sure that you collect the mass of bromoethylbenzene that you've collected and what volume of bromoethylbenzene that you've collected, okay? So for the mass, it's really easy. Tear the clean vial and cap that you're going to put it into and then put your bromoethylbenzene in there and wait again and you'll get the mass really easily, okay? The volume you're going to need to measure in a clean, dry, graduated cylinder. All right. Now, it is very reactive. Okay. So you want you want a small vial versus a large vial, and you want to store it in the dark of your drawer. Okay. So you want to put it in the back corner of your lab drawer. And make sure you put it in something that's not going to tip over. Make sure that it is capped tightly. So that no air can get in there, no oxygen can get in there to start reacting with the global ethyl benzene. All right? Um, the other thing is note what it looks like. Because next week, it may look different than it does this week. Make sure you write down not just that you stored the product in the drawer, but what did it look like before you stored it in the drawer. Okay? And like I said, just make sure it's, it's capped tightly and sealed off. So once you are done getting its yield, once you are done getting its volume, once you're done with these two tests, put it in that capped vial, put it in the back corner of your drawer so it has less time to be reacting on you. Okay? All right. Last thing we need to talk about, and I'll give you some information for that, is the pre-lab and the report for this experiment. So first of all, for the report, keep in mind, we've got three reactions involved in this report that you're going to be writing in the end. And so it's going to be a pretty extensive report and there the reactions are related to each other because you take one thing on to the next reaction to the next reaction. So everything is intertwined. So the report itself is worth 75 points, not just 50 points. Okay? It's a two week experiment. It's going to take the majority of both two weeks. Um, and there's the three reactions involved. So it's a 75 point experiment. Okay? So do a good job on it because it is worth so much. So your pre-lab, you want to make sure that you cover all three reactions in your pre-lab. And by doing a good job on your pre-lab this week means that next week you won't have anything to do for a pre-lab because you would have already taken care of it this week. Okay? And this week is a good week to do it because you don't have any 
reports due, but next week you will have reports due as well. In that pre-lab, you need to show all of the main, main pieces of the pre-lab, so purpose, reactions, your physical data table for all the reactants as well as all of the products. Um, make sure you show new equipment, show your flow diagram, show your yield calculations, show your reference, okay? So you need a yield calculation for each step. So there should be three. With that, steps one and two will be a regular yield calculation. Okay? You'll figure out your limiting reagent, figure out your theoretical yield, figure out your percent yield. Make sure you show these in your pre-lab and then you have to show them again after you've done the experiment to reflect the um, amount you actually use. So you show them twice. So steps one and two, that's how you're going to do the yield calculation. Step three is a little bit different. So the formation of the polystyrene, what we are going to use is just a comparison of the grams of polystyrene to the grams of styrene used. So the grams of polystyrene produced over the grams of styrene used times 100%. So what you are calculating is a percent recovery. Okay, so for step three, and only step three, you're calculating a step a percent recovery. So you want to show the example calculations for each of these steps in, in your experimental. So for step one and two, step one, you'll have to figure out what your limiting reagent is. The AIBN and the benzoyl peroxide are not limiting reagents, okay? They're sources of radicals, and they're not going to be limiting reagents, so don't base, base your calculations on that. You'll have to figure out between the NBS and the ethyl benzene, what's the limiting reagent. And then for step two, you have to assume that you'll make 100% of what you should have made in step one, to do your step two calculation, okay? So for your pre-lab, just count on in step two, you'll take 100% of step one and go to 100% of step two, okay? And then this is your step three calculation. Questions with that? Yes? Will the lab manual tell us uh, what to use for step one? Like hypothetically, what we're starting with? There's step one. Your ethyl benzene reacting with your NBS and your bromoxyl benzene. Right, I'm saying the amount for when we're doing the yield calculation. Yeah, it, it <coughs> tells you how much to use, oh, yes. So yes, yeah. Yes, the amounts are in there. <coughs> okay, so to help your with your pre-lab a little bit, I've got pieces for you. That's kind of your bonus gift for coming to pre-lab lecture. So here is what the table of reagents should look like for experiment seven. So we've got our rea reagents, we've got our product, bromoethyl benzene, making our styrene, and then the polystyrene is hard to say what its characteristics are, okay? Because it depends on what size polystyrene you have, okay? Then we've got even our testing reagents, we've got our solvents, everything that we are using in the experiment, the one thing on here don't, don't include is the dichloromethane, okay? So you've got all this information. What you'll have to fill in is the amount in moles for these pieces here and for the styrene, methanol, and um, THF you're going to use, you have to fill out the information for those chemicals, okay? But you may have that piece of information for, for your free lab. And once you have that information, um, you are, if you don't have any further questions, you are free to go.